Okay, good morning. Welcome to our Surrey meetup group uh, at Remax Little Oak. And today, you guys are blessed to have with us. We have with us a uh, gentleman who's been in the business uh, for about seven years. Ten years. Sorry. And uh, he started with our office in Abbotsford 10 years ago, and uh, he worked on a team for a while, and he's been on his own for a while, and uh, he's accomplished a lot of stuff, but uh, this last year, as a single agent, he topped the office. And I've had people come to the office and say they hope they get into the top 10 in their first year, and I say, that's a big goal. At Remax the Law, these are the top agents in the Valley. To get into the top 10, it's tough. To top the office is unbelievable. So Andrew's here to share stuff with us and pay attention. You'll probably get a number of things you can take away. If you do half of what Andrew does, you can copy. Help me welcome Andrew Rachel. Thanks for having me again. Hello to the people online. Do we actually have people watching? Three One. One. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Um... So yeah, thanks again. I had a great time. Uh, how many people are here today who were here a few months ago when I was here? Show of hands. So, and then we got some uh, some folks who have never seen you before. Um, so thanks for coming again if you came last time. And um, today we are going to talk uh, about time and the value of time and the value of your time specifically. And uh, it's my hope this morning that. Um, you know, I, uh, I pay off in your investment. Your, your time is worth something. We'll discuss that as we go this morning. And you know, I hope by the end of today you have a clear understanding of what your time is worth. And, uh, and you're able to, to measure that and say, you know, the use of those two hours this morning was, was a good expenditure of my time. And hopefully, um, you know, you get a return on your investment. This, what we're doing this morning, cost me something. Uh, it cost me, um, this maybe comes as a bit of a shock, but I'll say it, it cost me about $2,000 um, to do this this morning when you factor in the value of time, other things that go into it, um, you know, administration stuff, things like that. So I take this very, very seriously, and uh, I hope that, uh, that you benefit from this this morning just as much as I do. Um, I, you, know, you hopefully will get something through learning, and I get something through teaching, and, uh, and everybody goes home happy. So before we begin, I will read you a quote um, on the topic of time that I like very much. Time is free, but it is priceless. You cannot own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you have lost it, you can never get it back. Harvey McKay is the, uh, is the author of that quote. Uh, on your chairs, you have some packages that I put together for you. Please feel free to use that as we uh, as we go along. I'll maybe indicate when we're moving on to the next topic. And I also understand that do we have these available online for Brian? I think Rebecca. well, Rebecca's in the back. She's not listening. So I think we have this available online too. So for those of you that are online, you can access this as well. Here we go. Are we ready? Yes. Yep. Ready to learn? Yes. Okay, here we go. <coughs> there is a widespread pandemic in the personal service industry. Everybody understand what personal service industry is? No. No? Okay, so in the room today we have, how many realtors? Show of hands. Mostly realtors, we have any mortgage brokers? Yeah, lawyers? Financial planners? No, okay. So, stagers. what's that? Stagers. Stagers, yeah, excellent, also. So you trade, in the personal indus service industry, you are your business. You trade your time for money. So when I refer to personal service industry, all of those different businesses and all of those locations are under that umbrella, okay? You're not selling a product. You're not manufacturing something. You're not selling cars, building shoes. You are your product, and every day you wake up, you have to go to work and convince people of your value, okay? Personal service industry. There is a widespread pandemic in the personal service industry. When or where the pandemic started is unclear, but what is perfectly clear is the damage that this disease can cause 
when left untreated. Unlike many other infections or diseases, this particular strain has no immediate side effects and can have an incubation period for a number of years before any visible signs appear. What's most alarming is the immeasurable damage that can occur before early side effects are detected. What is uncommon and what makes this pandemic very lethal is what feeds it and causes it to grow. Its food source has no limits, is naturally occurring, and can reproduce itself in almost any environment. By now you may be asking yourself, what the heck is Andrew talking about? Surely if there is some evil of this magnitude in our industry, the business heroes of our time have identified it and are fighting it as we speak. One problem. <coughs> Many of those people who we rely on to lead us and those that set the standards within our respective industries helped to create the disease. In fact, most would not admit that a pandemic exists. What is our pandemic? What am I speaking of? Lack of personal services? There's a rhetorical question. I wasn't hoping that you were going to answer it right away. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But, that, but that's a good input. <laughs> you have in front of you an acronym. Any tab. This is my disease that I've created. Failure to acknowledge time as a value. Failure to acknowledge time as a value. Okay, we'll have some fun with some money. What am I holding in my two hands? Twenty dollar bills. Two bills. Who said twenty dollars? One twenty and one five. One five. Okay. All I thought it was a twenty. Are are they are these two bills crafted on the same paper? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are they the same size? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that they have the same quality ink? Mm -hmm. Same quality construction. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was your first name again? Beatrice. 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 Uh -huh. I can't roll my tongue, so I won't be able to say <laughs> it. Beatrice. B. 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 If I were to say to you, B, you can have one. You can have one of these. Which one would you like? The twenty. The twenty. Yes. Why? Because it has more value. I can acquire more stuff. <laughs> more stuff. Yes. More stuff. <laughs> for the same kind of uh, product. Okay. Seems so you, so you like buying even. things? Sorry? You like buying things? Of course. Yeah. You, like, you like buying things? You like owning things? Yes, of course. Maybe, okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah. What was your first name again? Greg. Greg. Yeah. If I gave you each one, any one of these, which one would you want? I'd probably pick the green one. Because? That's so it's worth more. It's worth more. Why do you say it's worth more? Well, we just know that it's fifteen dollars more than the blue one. <laughs> <laughs> because, be, because why? Who, who, who decides that? Canadian monetary system. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Because, because we're told, let me say this, we decide what each of these is worth because of what each can accomplish. Mm -hmm. Same material, same size, constructed the same way, same ink, weighs the same, one doesn't have the advantage over the other, but somehow we come to the conclusion that one carries more value than the other. And it's only because through our Canadian monetary system, <laughs> you know, the powers that be, one has the ability to accomplish more than the other. B, you get $20. Thank you. Right. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I that's so generous. I mean, no, it goes back to you. There you go. No, 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 that's yours. You, you were part of my demonstration. <laughs> so is it possible if if money if, if these bills can have varying values is it possible that our time can have varying values 
Is it possible that you know my hour can be worth less than B's hour? Is it possible that Brian's hour can be worth more than sorry, what's your first name? Paul. Paul's hour. I see heads doing this in the room. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> Write this down. You don't get paid for the hour. You get paid for the value that you bring to the hour. You don't get paid for the hour, you get paid for the value that you bring to the hour. So in my opening monologue, I made some pretty bold statements. I said that, number one, we have a pandemic that exists. Failure to acknowledge time as a value. Number two, I said what makes the pandemic most frightening and lethal is what it feeds off of. So I'll draw your attention to your next page, what fuels it. Now, we're going to draw some comparisons to uh, some physical ailments later on that, uh, that are actually it's quite interesting, the, the parallels that we'll find between what we'll discuss here and then what we'll discuss in the physical, some diseases that we can have. But what we're talking about today is, is mostly a disease or you know, a, a state of mind. So what fuels this thing that we're acknowledging, or that I acknowledge anyway as a pandemic, is, um, is something that is often recognized as, as one issue, but it shows itself in many other, in many other ways. So <coughs> you've got this, uh, this bubble with the spider web, and we're going to go to number one, and we're going to say, uh, I want you to write a number one line, haven't been taught. Sorry, I don't have the number for you. Oh, it's page, page four. It's page four. Sorry, I haven't given... Sure, you're right. <laughs> number two, where the symptoms. Sure. So right by number one. Yep, exactly. Okay. Where the bubble is, and the, the, I want you to write, haven't been taught. Number two, which is the one right up above the circle, I want you to write ignorance. Number three, I want you to write fear. Number four, which is at the bottom left corner there, I'd like you to write laziness. And number five, success. So just like any other disease or ailment, we can have various stages of that. We're going to talk about cancer a little bit later, and you know, for those of you who maybe experienced cancer or been touched by cancer, you'll understand that there's various stages of the disease, and depending on the stage that you're at, you can have different symptoms. Um, you know, the, it can be feeding off different things within your body, depending on how, how far it's progressed. Well, let's let's use that analogy to discuss. Fatab. So, level one uh, of Fatab, you know, you, this is this is an individual who, you know, you, you don't really have any fault other than the fact that you haven't been taught. You know, you haven't you haven't been. Maybe no one has taken the time to share uh, the value of time with you and these ideas behind it. Um, maybe you're new in your industry. You're just learning. You're fresh out of school. Um, but this at, at this level, uh, I put in brackets here above that little note. I put treatable. It's a very treatable stage of the disease, and um, you know, there's, there's probably many of us in this room. You know, we have symptoms of various stages. It's not as though you're only going to be in stage one or stage two or stage three, um, but uh, any symptoms in this stage are very, very treatable. Number two, ignorance. Um, you know, this is an individual maybe who uh, knows a little bit better. Um, but still shows no signs of change. Still hasn't, hasn't you know, decided to either believe or understand or learn about the value of their time. This is also treatable. Number three, um, at level three, 
this is where this, the, uh, the, this, this infection can start to infect the mind. It goes from you know, something that's more on the surface and you know, infection of the mind can begin and that's why fear, fear is often created in the mind. Fear becomes um, the third level of this, uh, of this infection. Four, laziness. Now we are, we're only in the sometimes treatable. And then five, the, the last and final stage, <coughs> success. Um, in my experience, I would say it's almost never treatable. And we'll get into why that is. Now, at the center of the circle, you can be asking, well, what is this thing? What's, what's, what's at the center of all this? I would suggest pride. You've got the definition of pride at the bottom of your page. A high or an order opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority, whether as cherished in the mind or displayed in bearing, conduct, etc. I'll give you uh, my own definition. An unwillingness or inability to admit that you don't have it all figured out. So having been taught ignorance, fear, laziness, success, these are the things on the surface that we see. But the root of all of these things is some form or variation of pride. Pride can rear its head in many, many, many ways. Okay. So let's discuss the symptoms of each phase. We've got the individual who hasn't been taught. Here's some notes and some thoughts. This individual performs activities to a mediocre standard. We're on haven't been taught? Yeah. Symptoms. We're on symptoms. Yeah, but haven't been taught. Correct. Now, take this the right way, but this individual doesn't know or realize how dumb they actually are. And what I mean by that is, you know, some, you all understand what self-awareness is? Yeah. Yeah. You know, being aware of one's own self in certain states and conditions yeah. and contexts. You know, sometimes, you know, we just don't know, right? We've never been taught, we don't realize, and then all of a sudden one day the light bulb goes <coughs> on and we go, oh. And then if you've ever had that moment in life where you look back and you go, I can't believe I did that or acted like that in that scenario. And it's only because of this new knowing that you look back on old scenarios in your life and you go, oh, I'm embarrassed. I can't believe I did that or said that. You know, now you know. Now you have self-awareness. Well, the person that hasn't been taught, they don't know any better. They don't know how dumb they are, right? They don't know that they don't know. There is no consistent plan, pattern, or thought put into business activities. That's pretty straightforward. A few months back when I was here, we talked a lot about philosophy. And you know, I shared with you, I said it's 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 critical that a strong philosophy is the base and foundation for all of your planning and all of your activities moving forward. This touches a little bit on that. A person who doesn't have a strong base, doesn't have a strong thought of where they are and where they want to end up, there's no consistency in their plan, there's no pattern or thought, they're just kind of balancing back and forth you know, victim to whatever the strongest wave is that, that comes along that day. It can be a good idea, it can also be a bad idea. This person resembles a boat without a rudder. Phase two, ignorance. Same as above, performs activities to a mediocre standard. This person tends to believe that they're smarter than they actually are. As we progress in these stages, the trend that we'll notice is that you know, as people become uh, more capable, they also become more dangerous, potentially dangerous to themselves mm -hmm. and dangerous to those around, dangerous to their business. Because you know, if you, 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 can, you can experience levels of success in our industries, 
um, without the proper solid foundation, you know, without the proper philosophy. And unfortunately, you know, if you, if you experience success in the wrong way or with the wrong patterns, you become a detriment to yourself and a detriment to those around. And level two, ignorance, is where that begins to happen because the mind now is starting to trick itself. The mind of this individual is telling this person, I'm smarter than I actually am. And then this person begins to believe it. This person knows better, but <coughs> continues their same activities and habits. Now, when, we, when, when you use the word ignorant, when you say, that person's an idiot, or that person is stupid. Why do we use that terminology? Most of the time it's because someone's doing something that they know they shouldn't be doing, right? Or you know they shouldn't be doing it. Yet they continue the same thing over and over and over. And so that person in our mind, they're ignorant. You don't want to spend time with them. They're annoying because they know better and yet they continue the same activities and the same habits. There is no consistent plan, pattern, or thought put into the business activities. Same as above, same as the person who didn't know any better, but a little more dangerous because the person who didn't know any better didn't think they knew any better. The ignorant individual where you know the infections start to take a little more hold, they're a little more dangerous because they're walking around with a little more arrogance, a little more confidence. This person resembles a speedboat without a rudder. <laughs> they got a little more pace, a little more energy, but when they bang into stuff, they can cause a little more damage. Figuratively speaking, of course, right? Their clients, their peers, their <coughs> family members. These are all people we come into contact with in our business, right? Anybody in the room been touched or affected by lung cancer? Yes? Yeah, my mother died. Your mother died. How long ago was that? A uh, year mark. Wow. Okay. So this is close to home. So um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time drawing some comparisons. I ask the question because I know it can be a you know a sensitive topic, and I I don't mean to misspeak in any way. Do you are you familiar with the stages of lung cancer? Uh, well, I saw her go through them. I'm not sure if yeah. there's names for all of them. Yeah. But. Yeah. So I'm going to draw some comparisons to, to lung cancer and what we're talking about. In no way do I mean to suggest that this is in any way the same thing, but there's some interesting parallels. Um, stages of lung cancer are stage 1, 2, 3A and 3B, and stage 4, okay, in that progression. Um, stage 1, obviously being, you know, the, the best, that's when you want to find it, that's when you want to discover you have it, and, and stage four, obviously, you don't. Um, stage one and stage two, um, the cells of the cancer haven't actually begun to, uh, to mutate and grow and get aggressive. It's in stage three that the cancer becomes aggressive, and that's why it's called stage 3A and 3B, because depending on how the, the cell itself has changed and what it's chosen to grow into, that determines you know, what, type of, you know, what type of cancer you have, how aggressive it's going to be, and how they choose to treat it moving forward. Survival rates are obviously much better in the earlier stages, and they get much worse in later stages. In stage one and two, survival rates of lung cancer are actually, you know, they're, I don't want to say they're quite strong, because lung cancer is a horrible thing to get, and many people succumb to it. But the survival rates are much better in stage one or two than once you reach stage three and the disease has begun to morph and grow and take over other parts of the body. Metastasis. What's that? Metastasis. Me is that the name? Metastasis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I bring that up because much like lung cancer, morphing in stage three, it's in phase three of FATAV that I believe this pandemic or this disease, if you want to continue to use that terminology, changes. And it moves from something that it just operates on the surface and it begins to infect the mind. 
and it begins to grow and it takes deeper hold within yourself. And from this point forward, treating it and finding the cure and you know doing the surgeries are much more painful than when caught in stage one and two. We're going to get to treatments and cures and things that we can do to, to, to fix ourselves later on. But it's at this stage that, that the game changes. And it's your mind. Much like cancer going into the lymph nodes, this sickness gets into your mind. And once it gets a hold of your mind, it can become very difficult to, uh, to reverse some of the tendencies. So phase three, fear. Performs activities from a mediocre to accomplished standard. So this individual, I mean, they've got some skill. They're not, they're not rookies. They're not necessarily beginners. On the surface, they're getting the job done. May be self-aware, but is afraid of change. So maybe some of you can identify, but we have moments in our life when we know something within us that we're either doing or a way of our thinking it's wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and it needs to change. And there's this, there's this conviction that happens within. And more often than not, you're feeling that because you have a self-awareness, right? Maybe a lot of self-awareness, maybe a limited self-awareness. But it's in that moment, you know, two things can happen. You either embrace the pain and understand that change is necessary, or there's a fear that arises because you know subconsciously that there's a pain that's going to be there to have to deal with that. So this person is afraid of change. There is a subconscious pain, that's what we're just alluding to, that is left sometimes unacknowledged. The best way to deal with this pain sometimes is to pretend it's not even there. You push it down, you forget about it, Continue to go about your activities, you're accomplishing your things to a mediocre, to sometimes, you know, advanced standard, and on the surface everything's great, but there's something growing. And you know there's something there, the longer you push it down, the duller it gets, and the more you don't realize it, the more you forget it, and you can continue your activities. This person resembles an aircraft carrier with no jets. Anybody who's ever watched, uh, I like watching... Uh, war documentaries and war movies, you understand that an aircraft carrier, I mean, it, it can be one of the most feared weapons in the history of war. But you strip it of its jets, and it's nothing. It's weak. And if you're on it, you should be afraid. Because, you know, you, so you would never, very rarely do you see an aircraft carrier either travel empty or travel without an entourage of gunships, battleships, submarines, because without its jets, it's, I mean, it's maybe got a couple a couple guns on board, but it's, it, what makes it lethal is the jets that it has. So this person who has fear resembles an aircraft carrier without its jets. <coughs> okay, we're into phase four. Infection of the mind is fully advanced. It's well on its way. This person can perform activities from a medium to accomplished, even to an advanced standard. On the surface, this individual can seem quite capable. Self-awareness could be present, but is fading quickly. Think for a second of someone in your life who, and, and maybe not everybody can, can think of an individual like this, but you know, this person, you look at them and you go, you have all the skill and potential in the world. You know, like they're, you know, you look at them, the natural ability, you know, whatever. And yet, 
they just can't figure things out. And it's that individual, you know, that you know, when they're at that level, when you look at them, you go, oh my gosh, skill, ability, potential, you know, natural panache, whatever, can hold the attention of a room. But what? Where's the breakdown? Very often, the breakdown is that laziness. This disease, failure to acknowledge time as a value, maybe started early on, and it's progressed to a point where, on the surface, what do we say? That person's a lazy ass. That's all they are. They can't get off their ass. And there's way more to it than that. It's not just that they're lazy. Because laziness is self-disrespect. This person's progressed to a point where they view themselves and their time as so little that they can't even muster the strength or the ability or the courage to get off the couch and go to work. And we look at them and go, they're lazy. That's what it is on the surface. But it's much more than that. There's a reason why it's that way. Deep pain exists, which causes paralysis of the mind, which leads to more fear and laziness. It's a vicious circle now, at this point. With this individual, self-doubt has now taken over. Just think for a second of the contrast. Let's go back to our, uh, let's go back to phase one, and think for a moment. Try to try to picture someone in your life that you know, who who might fit this. Right? This individual, they mean well. You know, they wake up every morning, they try hard, they just don't know any better, any better. Now contrast that to the individual that we're talking about today. And just think about the patterns in their life, the way they impact people when they're in a room, the way you feel when you're around that individual. Oftentimes when you're around the person who's at level four, like you can literally feel the life getting sucked out of you when you're with them. They require energy. They're not positive. They don't believe in themselves. Same disease, just farther advanced. This person resembles a submarine with no mission. <coughs> they're lazy. They're just sitting there. They're not protecting, they're not attacking. They're a dormant hunk of metal at the bottom of the ocean sitting there. Sounds awful to say it that way, but... <clears throat> now this is phase five, this is tough. This individual has experienced success. So unlike the first four stages where the symptoms on the surface can actually appear negative, negative to the self and negative to the surrounding group, now we've advanced to a point where symptoms are on the surface positive. Person's experienced success functioning the way they're functioning. And the success in the form of pride feeds the disease at an unbelievable rate. And when you experience success doing things a certain way, why change? This person performs activities from an advanced to a pro standard. This guy's a hero. Or this gal's a hero. 
receives awards, walks around, people worship the ground they walk on, people look to them for advice within the industry. <coughs> There's no reason to change because everything on the surface continues to encourage the current pattern. But a false reality has taken over that is fueled by those accomplishments. Now the disease is completely in the mind. Oftentimes, actually, there is a there's a there's a it's kind of scary, but there's a bit of a dual personality to this individual. They can be two different people in different circumstances. And it's largely because of this, this battle within, you know, that's going on. That, that may be pushed way, 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 way down, but there's a deep pain because, again, going back to, you know, there's a, there's a knowing. Sometimes, to some degree, there's a level of self-awareness, and they realize there's something wrong, they're doing something wrong. They need to make changes, you know, it isn't rewarding or something doesn't feel right. But the pain that's involved in making the changes is so great. Combined with the fact that everybody in their circle, everybody in their, in their environment, everybody in their industry is giving them awards, telling them that they're unbelievable, doing everything right. So that's why, you know, I said earlier, at this point, almost untreatable almost inoperable because such a shift has to occur for that person to come to a realization that they need to make change because everything else the current is flowing in the opposite direction <coughs> this person has little to no self-awareness is outwardly confident with many inner insecurities. Yeah, question, go for it. Um, I can take questions at any time. Feel free, anybody wants to interrupt me, fire up questions. Thank you. At the success level, yep. why does a successful person care about the failure to acknowledge time as a value? Do you think that? Say, say the question again. At the success level, yep. why does that individual care about the failure to acknowledge time as a value? He's successful. Yep. Um, Repeat the question. The question is, is, at the success level, why does a successful person... Why does he care? Why does he care about, about failure to acknowledge time as a value? He might not. But... Here's why he may. Because the success has come at a severe and great cost. And here's how. When a person fails to see the value of their time, the only answer they have to a problem, or the only way they've learned to be successful, is to throw more time at the issue. So, in your mind for a moment, try to imagine what you think a person in your life might reveal, who might be this person. And most often, this person is going to be a workaholic. It's going to be somebody that you know who has sacrificed 70, 80 hours a week. And so they might not care. If they're fine to continue, then that's great. But I'll tell you, I know some of these people, and on the surface they'll never say they care, but in here they do. No. And that's where the pain exists. Because they've hoard themselves out. They've never cared to think of their time as a value quot quotient or quotient. And the only answer they've ever had to anything is to, you know, and, and pride develops this, you know, I, I show up earliest, I work hardest, I work longest. This is the example they've set for those that, that look to them. And, and, you know, they get awarded for this, right? And that's the only thing they've known. And so, you know, I guess the answer could be uh, maybe they don't care, but I know there's a number that do. And at that point in time, it's, it's difficult because, you know, you've gone so far down the road and you've experienced so much success that way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> okay. Can I just add something? It, it, by um, not being, by not acknowledging time, mm -hmm. then um, you are reducing the possibility of improving um, your performance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the tendency in, in the personal service industry, and, and this is like, I know we have mostly realtors in the room, but this is this is totally outside the realm of realtors as well. Mortgage brokers, lawyers, uh, not, as, not to the same degree lawyers, uh, uh, financial planners, anybody who, any small business owner where their time is what they have, you know, they're not selling a product. The our environment, our culture, some of this is just Western culture, it's North American culture, tells us that what do you got to do to be successful? You got to show up early, you got to go home late. And when you're, not hitting your, when you're not hitting your goals, what do you do? Work on Saturday, work on Sunday, put more time in. And you know what, there's, there's a time and a season for that type of attitude and mindset. But, as you just stated, while doing that, you don't even realize the damage you could be causing to yourself in the sense that you're undervaluing your time and and you're not you're not training yourself or teaching yourself to increase the value of your time you don't even understand the value of your time you know increasing it is not even on the page it's not even in your, your mindset you don't even know that there's a value that exists to your time all you know is shoot i want to jump higher i want to accomplish more i better show up earlier i better show up later sometimes you know people Literally, people will say, how did you do it? I don't know. I got lucky. I don't know how I did it this year. I don't know how I accomplished that this year. Because then the following year, I certainly didn't accomplish that again. You know? And you see this this pattern within people's lives. And and some of that is just, some of it honestly is luck. You know? It's luck of the market. It's luck of the economy. It's, you know, all they know how to do is just show up more, show up longer. And, you know, eventually the value of their time just continues to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. And... It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good going out late at night or all day, every weekend, when, you know, you get to a point where you don't even know, you look at, what is the return? What am I getting for this? Why am I doing this? You know, you begin to question yourself. But that's the pattern. That's the vicious cycle. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. Oh, that's negative. Came here and dropped a bomb on everybody. What is the cure? Phase one to three requires a sustained treatment plan with some minor surgeries. <coughs> now we're talking figuratively, of course, but you can all identify. You know, there's moments maybe in your life where you've you've made changes. Maybe maybe for some of you, uh, it's a health change. You know, you decided to eat differently or exercise or, you know, put different things in your body. You know, depending on how far gone you are down the road, it requires different degrees, <laughs> different levels of treatment, different levels of pain. You know, the individual who's let themselves go for 20 years and they smoke and they, they drink excessively and they're 80 pounds overweight, that's a very different plan for that individual than the guy who, you know, he used to be an athlete and... Five years ago, he was really fit, but let himself go for five years, and he's got, you know, 20 pounds to, to shed and, uh, and a little bit of work to do. Very, very different treatment plan. And where it's most significant is, I mean, there's, there's a battle in the physical, right? You know, like with those, both those people, there's physical work that they got to do. But the real battle, the real war is right here in the mind. No different than what we're talking about, because... The disease, you know, different diseases, you know, different, we're talking about different diseases here, different, different fights, but by that point in time, it's advanced to a stage where, like, yeah, there's stuff going on here in that person, but the real battle's right here, self-belief. Mm -hmm. Phases four to five. <coughs> Require extensive, sustained treatment alongside major surgeries.
What's our time? Four five. Quarter. Quarter five. Ten eighteen. Ten eighteen. Okay. Okay, turn the page with me. Start to get into some of the treatment here. We can brighten up the room. Does that all sound very, very negative, what we've been talking about? Heavy. A little bit. Heavy? A little heavy? <laughs> well, you know what? It's it's heavy stuff. It's, um, you know, I when, when I do, you know, when I have the opportunity to do something like this, you know, you the, the temptation is um, to... Think, you know, how can I, how can I bring something of value to the room? What, what techniques, what tricks of the trade can I share with people that, you know, they're, they're going to get value? They're going to go away going, awesome. Raceville just showed me how to, how to do X. And the thing is, is that to do that properly, you always have to start with the proper way of thinking. It's always in the mind. So I can, I can show up here and I can give you, you know, we can skip the first five pages. And we can go straight to, you know, discovering the value of your time. But if we haven't discovered or talked about the root of the problem, the root of the issue first, then it doesn't make sense. It's not going to stick. It's not going to have the same impact. So, you know, it's important that you walk through, drudge through the difficult stuff, the negative stuff, um, so that when, you know, you get to the, to the application process, it's got more meaning because you understand why it's important. Okay, we're going to do a little math. Discovering the value of your time. Everybody in the room, take their yearly income from 2012. In your head? Yeah, do, write it on your paper or whatever. You've got calculators on your... Okay. Divide it by... No, I'm going to arbitrarily choose a number here. I'm going to say divide it by 46 weeks of work, which is 2,300 hours of work, which is based on a 50-hour work week. So this is saying that you worked 50 hours for 46 weeks, which means there were six weeks of the year that you didn't work. Okay? That's actually probably being generous. I would say that most of you didn't work 46 weeks of the year. And I know on paper you can go, well, I didn't take six weeks of holidays. But, you know, you got things like Christmas vacation and slow weeks at the beginning of January and blah, 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 that kind of stuff. There's very few people that would work more than 46 weeks a year. And the reason why I say 50 hours is because you shouldn't be working more than 50 hours. I know that some of you, I don't know, maybe you say you work 65 hours or 70 hours on average. But if you're working more than 50 hours, then you're doing something wrong because you don't need to. And you're devaluing your time. Okay, so yearly income divided by 2,300 hours. Throw some numbers out to me. Don't be shy. Well, a lot of people would throw on a hundred thousand fifty-two divided by fifty-two. Yeah. So a hundred a hundred grand is about forty-five bucks an hour. So we've got a mix of people in the room here. We've got people who've been in business for a while. We've got new people. We got people who've maybe made twenty grand this year, sixty grand this year, two hundred grand this year. I'll tell you this, if you're in the personal service industry, and no matter what you made last year, you could have made zero, you need to walk around and act as if you are worth $45 an hour, at a bare minimum. Because obviously when a person starts, I mean, you're, what's your value? Your value is nothing. You haven't done anything yet. But I'll tell you right now, there's people in this industry, you know, who maybe on paper, you know, their value is worth 65 bucks an hour. You could be brand new at this and you're more valuable than they are. And what people buy, when we're, we're going to talk about this more in a sec, but when in the personal service industry, let me make this comment, people are buying 20% what you know. and 80% how you feel about what you know. Mm -hmm. 
So you're new in your industry. You don't have to have it all figured out to think that you're worth, you know, 50 bucks an hour, 75 bucks an hour. Here's what you got to do. What you know, you got to have conviction. You got to be serious. And when you look across the table at somebody and you have a conversation, you knock on their door, you get, you hand out your business card for the first time. They, you might know this much, but you are freaking serious about that little that you know, and they can feel that when they talk to you. The emotion of what you know. Now we have the other the other side of the spectrum. Um, you know, maybe there's there's some people in the room today. They're not worth what their value was last year. You made 150 grand, you do the math, your hourly value is 70 bucks an hour, but you're not worth it. And you question whether or not you're even worth it. Here's a litmus test. Do people that you come in contact with rave about you? So I go shopping. I buy Cole Hahn Nike Air blue boots. These things feel like I'm walking on slippers. I actually didn't go shopping. My wife bought them for me. They're $180. I rave about these things. I tell everybody I know. Most comfortable dress you've ever had. 180 bucks. I've bought dress shoes for $50 before. Didn't rave about those. So, you know, whether a person spends $50 on a pair of shoes, $100 on a pair of shoes, $200 on a pair of shoes, makes no difference. But the shoes value or the car's value or the, you know, pick your other item that you spend on, is it worth what's being charged? And there's, and you know, there's a pro and a con to that. If it's not, if I buy these shoes, I spend 180 bucks on these shoes and they fall apart and they don't perform the function that they were intended to when first purchased, then what am I going to do? I'm still going to rave about them. I'm going to rave about them. <laughs> Rave's going to sound a little bit different. Right? Don't shop at Cole Hahn. Don't buy these shoes. These are crap. They said they were going to do this and they didn't do that. Don't work with Matt Tinsley. He said he was going to do this. That guy charged me X and X and X dollars. And he didn't do what he said he was going to do. I don't mean to pick on your math or <laughs> So we have to take on a mindset, you know, you, um, that, you know, you've got to start to think of yourself and your time as a value. Because this is what you do every day. You know, you show up in a meeting with somebody and you are your product. You are your sale. And you have to convince somebody of your value. Now, you know, we're in various industries where, you know, people don't want to talk about this, but values to some degree are set within an industry, right? We're not supposed to say, and you know, it, it, there, there really isn't industry standards, but, you know, there's, there's definitely some, some tendencies within the industry. And what does that make way for? That make way, makes way for people who are, are or have the ability to charge more than they should, and it also does the reverse. It also hurts some who should be able to charge more. But because of you know what norms are and what a lot of people do or what said standards are or what belief standards are, their their value is limited. So in order to you know walk through that environment and be successful, you have to always know what is my current value and what am I aiming to become. Constantly asking yourself this question, doing the litmus test. Do people rave about me, and what are they raving about?
Okay. Questions on that? I find it easier said than done. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about a little bit of the practical. Increasing the value of your time. How do you do it? Like you said, easy said, Bracewell, but <coughs> well, tell, tell me how to do it. You see, where I'm coming from, I've got to approach some people, and um, they're not really listening to me. And, you know, here I am. Um, it's probably the back of my time <coughs> here. What value am I bringing here? And, um, you know, the act of trying to persuade somebody to... Um, you know, listen to my counsel. Mm -hmm. I find, you know, and then I've got my time to think of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I'm just not looking at my watch, but um, um, I don't know. I find it very difficult to manage all this stuff. Yeah, that's a good question. Did everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. So there's two topics here that are very closely related, and in the next page we're going to address a little bit what you know, the issue you were you were just talking about. There's the value of our time, and then there's the value of us, of you as the person, right? And the value of your time is going to depend greatly, it's going to depend mostly, on your own value. And those two things can often be mistaken for one another, or even thought of as the same, but they're very, very different. So firstly, increasing the value of your time, or increasing the value of my time. Practical strategies. Time blocking. Designate specific times for specific activities. Personal services industry is awful for this. Real estate agents, mortgage brokers, financial <coughs> planners, Lawyers to some degree, small business owners, event planners, or was it a party planner? Staging. 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 <laughs> we, we think we think we have to work, do, react whenever the client demands. In what other industry does that happen? It doesn't happen. Any other industry, first of all, you, you want to get a hold of somebody, you can only call them between 9 and 5, business hours. Secondly, you want to make an appointment. Okay, here's the times that are available. Oh, it's that type of appointment? Okay, here's when we can serve you for that type of an appointment. By the way, if you want to cancel, you have to call us 24 hours in advance. Otherwise, we're going to still charge you. Imagine that. That'd be kind of nice. <laughs> time blocking designate specific times for specific activities now I'll, I'll just speak from this is, this is me this is not I'm not saying that this is you know foundational truth or gospel truth um, I have times of the day that I'm sharpest and times of the day that I'm dull and everybody's different some people I know like at night time they're just they're red some people six in the morning they're flying other people, you know, maybe mid-afternoon. For myself personally, I am, this morning, I knew I had this coming, right? And I wanted to be on for this. I woke up at 5.45 this morning. I went for a bike ride just to get my, you know, my juices going because I wanted to have all the energy in the world for you guys. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm, if I'm doing mentally tough work, if I need to think, perform, do something that involves all of me, right? I can't just do something subconsciously. I do my best to time block that activity in the morning. Okay, so in my business, that is, uh, and we'll, we're going to get into the breakdown of the different activities. But that's anything that is like business generation, ideas, marketing ideas, you know, concepts. Um, that's all happening first thing in the morning. I'm not doing a listing appointment you know, or a buyer appointment at 9 a.m. Because I can do that stuff subconsciously. I can do that without thinking. I've done that so many times over and over and over again. I don't need all parts of my brain functioning to 100% to do those activities. Now, I also am a slug after about 6 o'clock at night. I'm dead. And now in, in, in the real estate industry, a lot of people want to meet you at night. 
right? Mm -hmm. This is where it involves a lot of discipline. You do not allow yourself, you protect your nights and you protect your weekends. For me, I protect my nights because I know I'm not as effective at night. I need to see people at a different time of day. But it also makes my time more valuable if I compress my schedule and I force myself to accomplish more in less time. That's part of the <coughs> problem. Limit your evening and weekend workload. Be disciplined. And I'm not I'm not promoting that on the on the you know from from the holy platform, spend more time at home, you know, take Sunday off. Like I mean those things are all good. But I'm saying this completely from a practical perspective. Limit your time outside standard office hours for what it will make of you to achieve it. Put your clients on the clock. I have, every time I go into a buyer appointment or every time I go into a listing appointment, what, what do we all do? We tell people the start time. I'll be there at 3 p.m. I'll be there at 1 o'clock. But do we tell our clients, hey folks, so glad you had me over today. I'm really delighted that I'm here. I'm honored that you have me in your home again. Just want you to know we've got a lot of important stuff to cover today. I got some things. I got some important questions for you. I hope you have some important questions for me. Um, but I need you to know that we're on a bit of a, you know, we're on a clock. I have another appointment after this, or I've got something important I got to get to. So I've, I am yours for one hour and 15 minutes. And I got some things I want to say at the beginning. I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak, but I just want you to know that up front. What does that do? Instantly, you set the tone for the meeting. Mm -hmm. This is a business meeting. This is not, hey, I'm here to shoot the shit with you and have a coffee. Those things are great, but you don't do that in your business time. You've now just completely dictated the tone of the meeting. And not only is that time going to be most effective, not only are you respecting your time and respecting your client's time, you're increasing your value. Because you're training yourself to accomplish more in less time. I hear, you know, I, in our in, the, in our industry, I hear, I shouldn't say all the time, but I, I hear this from time to time, you know, people talk proudly about, yeah, I was just, I was in this listing appointment and I was in this home for three hours. <laughs> or, you know, I wouldn't let, I would not let them kick me out. Okay. I think in most often, that's a horrible use of your time. There's been some steps that have been seriously missed if you find yourself in a situation where you're in a home for three hours. Either they're friends of yours, which is fine. You know, if, you, if you're on that level of relationship with them and you want to spend that time with them, great. But if you're in a home for three hours, something's not going the way you was either intended or you never had a plan in the first place. And you got a bit of the uh, speedboat with no rudder thing going on. You get blown around a little bit. Here's a good one. Eliminate doing activities that are worth a quarter of your value of your time or less. Eliminate doing activities that are worth a quarter of the value of your time or less. So, I told all of you no matter what, you've got to walk around like you're $50 an hour, <coughs> even if you're not. What does that mean? That means that $15, an hour activities-ish and below, you're farming those out and leveraging that as much as you possibly can. Now, there's, you know, there's a fork in the road that you get to when you're in this scenario and you go, geez. You know, I I only made I made I made seventy thousand dollars last year. I know that Andrew said walk around like I'm worth fifty dollars an hour, but really I only made twenty seven dollars an hour. <coughs> Why am I paying somebody sixteen dollars an hour? And I'm not talking hiring a full time assistant. I'm just there's 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 certain activities, certain things that you can farm out, and it might be worth sixteen bucks an hour or something like that. You know, how can I do that? I only made seventy dollars. There at some point in time, there's risk. You know, for the gentleman in the room, you got to put your balls in the line. You got to act it before you actually are it. 
because that's the only way, or shouldn't say the only way, it's one of the key ways to increase the value of your time. Because when you're not using your time in a $15 an hour activity, what are you doing with it? You're using it in a $50 an hour activity. And the more time you can spend doing those types of activities, the more you're going to be able to increase your value. The more time you spend loading pictures on a website, creating your own feature sheets on whatever computer program, I don't even know what to say because I've never done it myself. Um, you know, the more time you spend doing those things, the less time you have for business generation, business management, business sales and operations. And those are the things that not only make you money, but those are the things that are going to be able to increase your value. Because as you become better and more proficient and faster, you're able to do more. And that's how your value goes up. Break time? Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to break, <coughs> but I'm going to say one more thing that is related to this. Here's a warning. And this speaks somewhat to Larissa's comment or question from a few moments ago. Earning more money is no guarantee that the value of your time has increased. Most people spend more time to earn more money. So, you know, ask yourself, maybe it's maybe you're in that circumstance, or maybe, you know, a great thing, I mean, most of you guys are in real estate here, go to somebody in your office who in 2012 had you know, a significantly different year than in 2011. They made a significant change in their income. And have this conversation with them. Ask them, hey, how much did you work in 2011? And how much did you work in 2012? What was your stress level in 2012 in comparison to 2011? And I mean, the reality is, is that I think some people will say, well, you know, I worked the same amount, or there wasn't that much of a difference, and, you know, there, there's some reasons for that. Maybe in 2011 they were at the office, but they weren't actually working at the office. They were playing Angry Birds or something like that, right? Um, but, you know, it's a good question to have with somebody who's made a drastic improvement, because I would say in most circumstances, um, you know, people have increased their value, or maybe they have to some degree, but they've also to some degree just learned to spend more time to make more money. So work smarter. Yeah, and we're gonna get we're gonna talk about some more of the practical application after we get break. All right, talk to them. Okay. So she understands. Let's grab our seats. Cameron asked me if he could be there in case that you handles a $100 bill. <laughs> and I said, I will be generous, Cameron. I no am done handing out money. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. More money. More. Yeah. That story is over. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, but towards the end of our time together, I will be handing out bills. So it's great to camera here, you know, because somebody's oh, a camera. <laughs> this is your chair. You're going to get a bill. You're going to have to pay yeah. for that. Oh. Right. Uh, okay, so we've sitting, made... Sitting in home seat. Yeah. The, the people who are online didn't have uh, the ability to converse with people and have coffee, so we'll get going for their sake, or his sake, if there's no one else. <laughs> okay, so when we left off, we were... Uh, oh, there's three. There's three on the webinar. Oh, there's three on the webinar. All right, we have a group. Oh, wow. Um, when we left off, there was we were we were just finished talking about discovering the value of your time, and or sorry, increasing the value of your time, and then you know we went through some practical strategies and how to do that. And I wanted to share one more with you, as I was philosophizing in the bathroom during the break. <laughs> I actually I have an idea that I'm going to implement, and normally you know when I when I do these things and I share ideas, my my policy would be that I have to have done it to share it because, you know, I haven't actually been able to, to see the result. But I feel so good about this one and so strongly about this one that I know it's going to work, so I'll share it with you now. Um, 
part of the chat, so we're going to talk specifically about, you know, new appointments now, whether it be a buyer appointment or a, uh, or a seller appointment, uh, you know, when you're talking in the real estate industry. And, you know, if you're in a different industry, you can find your own scenario in your head to relate, hopefully. Um, there is a drastic difference between going into an appointment uh, with someone that you already know and someone that you don't know. Would we all agree with that? whether it be a buyer or a seller, and specifically to the time involved. And let me, let me suggest that this is the reason why. When you're with the person you know, trust is already established. You're more often than not, you're not on the hot seat. You're not having to prove anything or show anything or you know, convince them that you're capable of what they're asking you to do. Whereas conversely, when you're in a meeting with somebody that you've never met, and even though this person could have could have been referred to you, or you know it could just literally be a completely cold meeting, maybe it was a sign call, uh, someone you encountered, you know, at a coffee shop, door knocking, whatever. Now you have the arduous. Is that the right word? Arduous task. Arduous. arduous, 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 arduous. arduous. I was never an English major. <laughs> arduous task of before you even get to the actual activity that you're there for, which may be listing their home or hopefully listing their home or showing them homes, you're talking about a buyer, you gotta convince them of a number of things. You gotta convince them that you know what you're doing. They have to like you. You know, you gotta talk a little bit about your philosophy. They've gotta have, you know, the two of you are gonna have to come together and agree on some things, whether it be spoken or unspoken. There's going to be a lot going on under the surface that has to happen before you can even get to the quote-unquote money-making activity. That is part of the problem when we talk about time blocking and limiting our appointments to a certain time. When we go into these appointments, it can be extremely challenging to keep the appointments to the, to the desired time in order to increase your value. So, here's the strategy. You ready? Yeah. I'm in the middle of doing this myself. You're going to have some videos made of yourself. These videos, you're going to make, uh, I would say, it's probably going to be, I, I might make three to four different videos. They're short. They're uh, video experts in the industry will tell you that a video should be anywhere between 30 seconds to a minute in total length. Uh, otherwise, you lose the audience. You're going to have a buyer's presentation video. You're going to have a seller's presentation video. You have a video that discusses your philosophy and how you view the world and your business and everything in it. And you might have another video, you know, depending on you know who you are and what you do, and if there's something you're extremely passionate about or something that is unique to you, you might do a fourth. I mean, I'm not going to give you an idea, but you can you can think about what that might be. But here's why. So these videos. Again, I haven't done this, but I know it's going to work to an incredible standard. These videos are going to be used. So somebody calls you up. Hi, Stan. <clears throat> it's Bob. You don't know me, but you know my cousin Carl. He says you're a great guy. Um, so we want to talk to you. We need to sell your home. But Stan, I want to be up front with you. Just so you know, uh, you know, we want to do our homework, and we're going to have uh, another guy from your office, Andrew Bracewell, in as well. And uh, then there's another guy from uh, Landmark by the name of Vaughn Neeson. You know, our neighbors sold with him, and they had something good to say. So we're going we're, we're to talk to the three of you. Um, but but we, we want to talk to you, Stan, because, you know, we hear good things. Stan doesn't know this guy from a hole in the ground, but he's got the appointment. <coughs> Stan, this is, this is now Stan in the response. Hey, Brian, or whatever the guy's name is, I really appreciate you calling me. You know, I, um, I'm excited that, you know, you want to meet me. I'm excited that you know so-and-so who recommended me. Um, and, you know, I, you know we, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you Tuesday at 6 p.m. But, Brian, i got one thing to ask of you. Um, could you watch a short video? It's really easy. I'm sending it to you on your email right now. There's a link in the video. And what that video is going to do is it's going to tell you a couple things about me, Brian. It's going to tell you how I work and how I operate. It's going to give you an idea of what makes me tick and how I function throughout the day. It's going to talk a little bit about my, my abilities and what I'm going to, get, going to do to get the job done for you. And why I may, here's the key word, why I may be 
why I may be the best fit for you. Not why I'm number one or why I am the best. Why we may be the best fit for one another. Now, Tuesday rolls around, knock, knock, knock. Door opens. Hi, Stan. Hi, Brian. So nice to meet you. Brian's watched a 45-second video. If he's done what he's told and the video's done what it's accomplished, I will guarantee you that you've already climbed the ladder a little bit on relationship. You've climbed the ladder a little bit on rapport. You've climbed the ladder a little bit on trust. And you're not going to have to spend as much time fishing through the arduous task <laughs> of getting to one know one another, establishing those items, because some of that's already been accomplished. Not to mention, Stan's the only guy who sent something like that. So the, in terms of just impressing the client, like, I mean, that's just over the top, because nobody else has done that. And now Stan has the ability to roll in and say, hey, Brian, as I mentioned, I really appreciate you having me over today. Brian, I know that you're probably a busy guy, and, and I can tell you, you know, like I, I, I'm, I'm a fairly busy guy as well, and I respect your time. And in order to respect your time, I want you to know that, you know, I've come prepared to, to spend an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half with you. Uh, but before we begin, I want to ask, did you have a chance to watch that video? <coughs> and hopefully he says yes, because if he says yes, it's the perfect foundation to lead into your presentation and to lead into your time. He's already primed. You've completely, you've greased the pump. It's all ready to go. If he says no, no problem. Oh, you know what? You didn't get a chance to look at it? I understand. you got three kids. i got three kids. You know, life is busy. It's no problem. i got my laptop here. It's really important that you look at that because of the content that's in it. It's only 45 seconds. I'm going to get it going. While you're watching this, I'm just going to take a quick spin around your house. Just to, get a, just to get an idea, you know, I've, I've, I've been in homes like yours before, but it's important that I take a quick run around. So just take a couple minutes to watch this video. Sit right here. I'll go walk around on my own, and I'll be right back, and, uh, and we'll begin after that. You're doing so many things by doing this. In fact, it's almost just as good if they haven't watched the video. Because by, by saying, using language like, hey, before we begin, you're completely disarming them. I mean, you're, you've come into people's homes. They're nervous to have you there. They're, they're showing you their, probably their most valuable asset and possession. And, you know, maybe probably they think it's worth more than you're about to tell them, and they might even know that. And, and you know, part of, part of getting through, breaking through to the next level is disarming somebody. How can you disarm somebody with simple language? Hey, Matt, before we begin, oh, good, we haven't begun yet. It was about... <laughs> Holy crap, I thought we were, we'd begun, but we haven't begun. Good, okay, Matt's now relaxed. Before we begin, Matt, I just want just, just watch a short video. It's a really cool little video, you know, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check your place out while you do this. Great. I haven't done it, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be unbelievable. Okay? Moving on. Believing in your own value. Up until now, we've been talking about time. Time is not a person, right? Time can be a lot of things. It can be a concept. It can be a value. It can be a, it's not a person. Believing in your own value, now we're talking about the individual. We're talking about you. The greatest way to impact the value of your time is to increase the value of yourself. You got your pens ready? I'll let you finish writing. <coughs> if you go to work on your goals, your goals will go to work on you. If you go to work on your plan, your plan will go to work on you. Whatever good things we build, end up building us. You 
If you go to work on your goals, your goals will go to work on you. If you go to work on your plan, your plan will go to work on you. Whatever good things we build, end up building us. The late, great Jim Rohn. Here's an Andrew Bracewell quote. Belief is a byproduct of continued forward motion. And you can even say belief in oneself, because that's really what we're talking about. Belief in your value, if you want to work it, word it that way, is a byproduct of continued forward motion. Belief is an interesting thing. And, it, and it's even, it's, it's almost like it's one of those things that's hard to pin down and hard to identify because, you know, you, it, would be, it would be easy to say, well, I believe something, therefore I can accomplish it, or I believe something, therefore, you know, it is. But it's not quite that simple because belief can only happen once we've already done something. Because it's in doing those things that belief happens. It's somewhat, I mean, a person could, could equate it to, to, to the terminology of the word faith as well. It's a chicken and egg thing. Which came first? <coughs> and I don't know the answer to that, but what I know is when I step back and I observe the patterns and other people, the best I've been able to come up with is belief is a byproduct of continued forward motion. I don't necessarily know when it began. And it's hard to determine exactly when it did. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it only exists when there's continued forward motion. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. When desiring to grow, belief in your new slash higher value must occur before your new or higher value is reached. So I said earlier, you know, if you're if you're new to your industry, and you know, um, you haven't made a dime, you know, technically speaking, on paper, you have no value. Well, we know that that's not necessarily true. If if you're sitting here today, whether or not you've earned something, you have a value, but it's difficult to quantify that because you don't have any statistics or history to measure up to and say, here's my value. So belief in a value must come before the value is realized. And I said, hey, you know what? None of you should be walking around thinking you're worth less than $50 an hour. Why? Because that's what it takes, that's the bare minimum to survive and thrive in your respective industries. If you're not worth that today, you better figure out a way to get there. And to get there, you're going to have to believe. You're going to have to have faith that you can make it. You have to put some of those practical steps in place that we just finished talking about before the break. The actual itemized activities. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Over time, with continued forward motion, belief will appear. And before you know it, who knows which one came first? Your value has increased and, and you believe in your own value. Without belief, the value is actually... It's not real. There's some ancient wisdom, and it goes like this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern. And actually in the Aramaic text of the same writing, uh, the Aramaic text uses the word renovation, which I actually like even better. So be transformed by the renovation of your mind, so that you may discern. Clearly here the writer understands that for change to occur, it must happen here first. Be transformed by the renovation of your mind so that you may discern, so that you may make the decisions in your business, so that you may 
confront the challenges that come so that you may decide, do I, do I do this marketing piece, do I not? Do I, do I jump in with the trend of what everybody else is doing or do I not? Be renovated here so that you may discern. Okay, here's where belief in one's own value makes the biggest difference. I got five minute warning. Communication. Write that down, circle it, underline it. Communication. Do we all, we probably don't understand, so I'm going to draw a diagram for you while you're writing. just created the human brain. <laughs> the human brain is, decided into th is divided into three primary compartments. We have the primitive brain, which is the innermost core. We have the limbic brain, which is the second core. We have the rational brain, which is the outer core. These degrees and areas of the brain have been discovered years ago by people much smarter than anybody in this room. But here's what we know. The primitive brain is what is responsible for survival, okay? Survival instincts, fight or flight, the need to eat, the need to defend oneself, it's animalistic, hence primitive brain. The limbic brain is where we feel emotion. Some of thing, things like a mother's motherly instinct to nurse her child, you know, in places where no one could have possibly told her that. Um, our self-belief, our self-identity is formed in our limbic brain. The way we view ourselves, the way we think about ourselves. The rational brain is for those engineers in the room. The Albert Einsteins of the world. Facts, figures, strategies, mathematics, equations, data. That's where we collect data. Now, interestingly enough, you would think that it is in our rational brain where we make our decisions. But it's not. Decisions reside in the limbic. So while when we go into scenarios and situations and times of question and Times of self-doubt, we we think, oh, I gotta, uh, I gotta collect the stats, I gotta collect the data, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta know what I'm doing before I make this decision. That is not actually where <coughs> decisions get made. Yes, we spend great time collecting all of those necessary things in the rational brain, but at the end of the day, most people, what do they say? Emotional. They go with their gut. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick that person? Why did you decide to do that? It just felt right. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it to you. It felt right. We connected. He's my kind of guy, she's my kind of girl. I felt like we had a lot in common. These are concepts and things that we can't actually nail down. We can't, we can't put a stop to it, right? We can't measure it, can't mark it. It's just, duh, it's right there. Now, why communication, or why belief in oneself is so important in communication? Communication is 20% what you know, 20% the rational, and 80% how you feel about what you know.
Okay, I meant to bring a nail. This is a nail. I'm in an appointment with somebody. They want to list their home. The nail represents, I mean, I've got all the data in the world. I've got all the stats. I've got the best presentation. I've got all the data to prove it, you know, and I am just, I'm firing nails at them. I mean, I could, 20, boom, boom, boom. And in most circumstances, they're just bouncing off, bouncing off, bouncing off. But if I take that nail and I tape that nail to the end of a broomstick and secure it properly, I can drive that nail into your heart with one shot. And that's only because of this. The belief in what one person is saying. How you feel about what you know. <coughs> but you cannot possess that ability, that quality, unless you believe. Because it's in your limbic, your own brain, that you derive your own feelings about yourself, your own self-belief, your own self-worth. If you don't believe it, it's impossible for it to come across in any presentation. And all you'll do is you'll throw nail after nail after nail at the board. And you'll experience frustration, as was alluded to earlier. You know, I'm explaining things to my people. I'm, they're not listening to me. I'm trying to get them to understand. And it's just, it's like nails bouncing off a board. There's something's missing. There's no stick secured to the end of the nail, and you're not driving it deep. And you won't be able to unless you believe it here first. I do. Oh, you're probably in progress. <laughs> you're on your way. No, no, no. Okay. Jump ahead. We're gonna. We're, we're out of time. Or we're, we're running out of time. I want to say. Go to the mental shift. Go to your last page. I'm gonna fill in some uh, some holes for you. The two pages that you're skipping. You'll notice those graphs. What I did there is I actually had. Those are two different case studies of actual agents in our office without their names, of course. And it's the measure of the volume of sales that they did in 2012 <coughs> and the month that they did each of them in. And if you draw a line along the graph, you'll see the spikes. You know, one month there's X sales, the other month there's zero sales. And what uh, we could do with that, perhaps another time, or you could do on your own, is you take that graph, and then you measure that graph against <coughs> um, activities the breakdown of, of different activities that we value within our business. So there's that page that says the application process. Uh -huh. um, what, what that is is this. We've got business operations and sales, business management, and business development. So what I've done, I'll just go, I'm going to briefly touch on this so this makes sense to you. I've said every successful business gives careful attention to each of its departments. Sales, operations, finance, and business development. In my business, I am the manager of every department. Okay, finish that sentence. In my business, I am the manager of every department. So this is where this is a common practical mistake that many people in our industries make. You know, we spend. I mean, shoot, you're in real estate sales, so you think all of your time should be spent in real estate sales. Not true. I broke down, you know, this isn't this isn't the only way to interpret it, but this is the way I interpret it. Business operations and sales, business management, business development. So we won't do this here together. You can fill this out on your own. But think about all the activities that you <coughs> perform throughout your throughout your week. There's a ton of stuff that you do or should be doing that isn't actually actually operations or sales related. There's management items, and then there's business development items. Those are business development items obviously being things that are going to bring you, if it's January, those are the things that are going to make sure you have something to do in February and in March 
and in April. And you know, as we experience our peaks and valleys, the common mistake of most agents is that it's in that month that you, you things are amazing. You've got so much that's going on. You're working with three buyers, you did two listing deals, at the end of the month you've closed five transactions, and all your time was spent on operations and sales. And there was absolutely no time dedicated to business management or business development. And then what's the inevitable pattern after the month of five sales? It goes down. Zero. Zero the next month, zero the next month. And it's just this continue, continued peak and valley, peak and valley, peak and valley. The challenge or the key, to the, you know, the hope is that even in those months where you're super busy with sales, which are fantastic, you must be allocating appropriate time to business management and business development. And then if you look at, you know, there was those two agents that we used. Uh, one agent did 18 sales, one agent did 34 sales. So I didn't use crazy examples, right? I used very achievable numbers. You'll notice the difference of consistency in the agent that made 34 sales to the agent that did 18 sales. Mm -hmm. But conversely, I know agents who did 45 to 50 sales this year who were very much peak and valley. So this is not something that's like, you can't say, well, the guy's successful, so he's got to figure it out. I don't know, his peaks and valleys are just bigger. That's all. But the same problem still exists. So it goes back to our time blocking, allocation of activities, understanding what are the three main departments that drive my business. You're not just a real estate salesperson. You are in real estate management, you are in real estate business development, or you are in staging management, staging development. You are a mortgage broker, you've got management, development, sales and operations. I would suggest that a proper breakdown, and this might come to surprise some of you, but it's roughly one third, one third, one third. Mm -hmm. And of course, the challenge is this. So in a week where you're working with two different buyers, you take a listing, you work on a couple deals, can you still allocate roughly one third of your time to business management and one third of your time to business development. If you can manage to do that, you've done two things. Number one, you've automatically made your time more valuable. Because think of everything that you're accomplishing in roughly 15 to 20 hours when it comes to operations and sales. So your time, the value of your time is going through the roof. <coughs> Number two, you're ensuring that you're gonna have a repeat month the following month or the month after that because you're not taking your attention off of business development and business management, which are the things that feed us down the road, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days down the road. Make sense? Yeah, when you say business development, to what specifically? New marketing ideas, new strategies, how I'm gonna, I mean, in my own world, it's how am I communicating with my database? Am I doing everything I can to leverage? I mean, it's so easy to drop activities and drop habits when all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're extremely busy. And, um, you know, it's that, that is, that's the peak and valley pattern that you see in, in many, many agents. Okay, you know what, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna cap it there. Um, I apologize that we didn't get to uh, the mental shift. Maybe another time, but I know Ray wanted to allot some time for some stuff at the end, so. Uh, well, there are Q&A. Sure. Go ahead. Can you use a summary of the mental shift? A summary of the mental shift? <laughs> How much time do we have? What time? It's 25 after. We, we have uh, we have seven or eight minutes. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to the mental shift. <laughs> so what I mean, I mean, I, let's, let's first of all make sure that this makes sense. The mental shift is... You know, we haven't, let's go back to failure to acknowledge time as value. It's not my belief that, you know, any of us ever get cured from this, okay? We actually all have cancerous cells in our body right now. Mm -hmm. So, at any given time, any one of us in this room is, you know, will have various symptoms from various levels, depending on, you know, Life's variables, what we're going through, what we're experiencing, you know, life happens, right? That's all part of it. Um, the mental shift is a self-awareness. You're now aware that the pandemic exists. 
you're aware that <coughs> your time is value. You take pride in that. You have an increased self-respect. And you actually, you have an increased self-respect for others in their time as well. The majority of your activities are initiated by you, not a reaction to something else. You can probably all quickly understand the difference between those two things. Everything you do has purpose. Here's a good one. The cost of your time is taken into consideration in everything you do. And the return of your investment is weighed against the cost. This is this is huge. In in our industries, we are confronted challenge all the time, right? People want you to perform something for less, do something for free, do something their way. And these are all fair questions. It's the free market. People can, can ask, do what they want, right? And there are circumstances that I believe that, that you should concede. You know, for various reasons. It's another conversation another day. But how different it is, how different that conversation is when you understand your own value, you believe in your own value, and then you understand what's being asked based on the time you're putting in and that cost. Completely different conversation. The confidence that you have in that conversation the way your language, the language you use, the way you relay your message, the way people are going to interpret that and respond to that, there's an authority that you carry that is completely different. And over time, those conversations will actually happen less. Because subconsciously, people will perceive your value to be more. And you won't be asked or put into those circumstances as often. I'll finish with this. Um, you are less prone to stress because stress is often a result of having neglected one of the three major business departments. So we just talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. Business operations and sales, management, and you know, revenue generation or business development, whatever you want to call it. Most often, not always, but most often, stress comes as a result of a lack of attention to one of those over a period of time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. No Was that great or what? Great. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just uh, in closing, um, you know, time and value is a big deal. We're working with it every day, and um, if you, it's, it's not an, it's not an easy thing. So you got to go to work on it because uh, a lot of people mistake price and value. So we, we have to become very good at not only practicing but explaining. So you have to become good at practicing to explain to people. You know, it looks like the price is more. But we're not selling price, we're selling value. And if you don't help people understand the value, they won't understand your price. You see, discounters can just say, look, I don't have any value, but I charge less. You know, I know sometimes people struggle. I, I had a lady in our, sitting right in this room, her and I, bars, and she, she said, said to me, she says, Ray, she said, I, did, I did a transaction. She's in a different brokerage. She did a transaction with nobody to help her. It was a huge commercial transaction. And she left 60 some thousand dollars on the table in commissions. And I, I asked her a question. 
I asked a simple question. I said, did you once in the discussion ask the seller this? And her face just dropped. She said, I, di I didn't know about that. I said, did you ask this? She goes, no. I said, are you saving about $3,000 a year on your fees at this other brokerage? She goes, yeah. I said, so for the $3,000 you're saving, being in a brokerage that doesn't help you, should you spend the $3,000 and have that $65,000 in your pocket? She's still not here. <laughs> she's still struggling between the price and the value. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we got lots of good information. We'll continue on next week. Well, if you're not in the meetup group, there's, there's like some cards on the table. Join the meetup group, and then you'll see what's going on. We're here mostly every week, and we got lots of good stuff happening this year. Randy Dick's going to be here. I don't know when, when but he's going to come back. Andrew's, Andrew's going to come back. I've got him booked several times this year, so kind of watch the schedule. And then when those guys aren't here, you might have to listen to me. <laughs> but uh, you know, we always got to bring value. So have a great day, and uh, we'll practice some of this stuff. And let's give Andrew another some appreciation. <laughs>